Good afternoon and, and welcome everybody. I'm David Horn, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Christopher Nichols. Uh, the format today is a bit different from other inaugural lectures, which celebrate the promotion or hiring of professors in the Division of Arts and Humanities. Dana Renga, the Dean of Arts and Humanities, will have more to say about Chris's scholarship and his path to our Department of History in a few minutes. But today, we also mark and celebrate Chris's installation as the Wayne Woodrow Hayes Chair in National Security Studies at the Mershon Center. As you know, appointment to an endowed chair is one of the highest honors an academic institution can bestow upon a faculty member. These positions are also important for the reputation of both college, both on our campus and well beyond it. An endowed chair signals to the broader world both the distinction of the faculty member who holds it and the values of the departments and centers in which they work. The Hayes Chair is, as you all know, named for Woody Hayes, who was the university's head football coach for a remarkable 28 years. Hayes was not only interested in football strategy, but also in military strategy, and was an insightful amateur historian. He is also remembered as a coach who pushed his players to su succeed academically. His widow Anne and his son Judge Stephen B. Hayes led the effort to create the endowment for the Hayes Chair, and they were joined by hundreds of friends, alumni, and members of the university community some of them are with us today. The campaign to fund the Hayes Chair was completed in 2001. There is perhaps no better example of what Hayes called paying forward than all of these people coming together to make it possible for us to recruit an outstanding faculty member like Chris Nichols, whose research and teaching will, in turn, inspire the next generation of scholars and leaders. It is now my pleasure to present a medallion to Professor Nichols, officially recognizing him in his post as the Wayne Woodrow Hayes Chair in National Security Studies at the Marshawn Center. to hear from Chris shortly. But next I'd like to introduce the director of the Mershon Center for International Security Studies. <laughs> professor Dorothy Noyes is College of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor of English with a joint appointment in the Department of Comparative Studies, which just happens to be my home department. <laughs> An expert in political ritual and the ethnography of performance, Dory also holds courtesy appointments in anthropology, French and Italian, and Germanic languages and literature. From 2005 to 2014, Dory directed Ohio State's Center for Folklore Studies. She's a longtime affiliate of the Mershon Center, and last summer began her appointment as director. Please join me in welcoming Professor Moore. I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Mershon Center for International Security Studies to the installation of Chris Nichols as the Wayne Woodrow Hayes Chair. The Mershon Center is one of the components of the legacy of Ralph Davenport Mershon on the Ohio State campus. Ralph Mershon, as many of you know, was a pioneering electrical engineer in the heroic age of American infrastructural and technological innovation. He was a key figure in the development of long distance transmission technologies, alternating current and electro, sorry, electrolytic condensers. The son of a watchmaker in Zanesville, Mershon came to Ohio State as a student in 1873 
and remained involved with the university until his death in 1952. In his spare time from amassing 93 patents, he became an army colonel in the First World War, co-founded the Inventors Guild, was active in the national expansion of boys' clubs, co-founded the Reserve Officers Training Corps, created Ohio State's college system and budget model, activated and presided over its alumni association, took a lively interest in theater, hence our Marchand Auditorium, and thought a lot about what education for citizenship should look like. In short, Ralph Marchand was almost as energetic as Chris Nichols. <laughs> the Merchant Center was, itself was established in 1960 in the context of the Cold War. It has long collected distinguished scholars and practitioners in military history, international relations, and diplomatic history to reflect on problems in American and international security and foreign policy. As the Cold War ended, and the nature of national and global security was revealed to be still more complicated than we realized, Merchant broadened its scope and truly began to reflect Ralph Merchant's own interest in civilian populations and in citizenship as central to national and international flourishing. Merchant today welcomes affiliates from disciplines across the university and is especially strong in putting social scientists and humanists into conversation. We study not just the conduct of war, but the costs and the aftermaths of war. We study the hard positive work of peace building. We study the interplay of different scales of security and insecurity, not just the nation state, but the international order and the lives of human communities on the ground. We study the institutional frameworks and the social processes that foster or mitigate conflict. And we work hard to think about the world, not just from a US standpoint, but to listen to what people are saying in other countries and in the rest of the world. Though it is not easy, we try to draw back from the hot button issues and place them in historical and comparative perspective so that we can reframe problems more productively. The Merchant Center takes pride in its approach to gathering faculty talent. We have not gone around collecting moose heads to hang on our walls, but we have tried to privilege interesting minds who are not just repeating the latest mantras from Washington or from their disciplines. This was certainly the case with our first taste chair, John Mueller, whose contrarian wit and mastery of inconvenient facts have poked holes in no end of foreign policy orthodoxies and have also deflated the pieties of foreign policy critics. In retirement, Mueller remains a Marchand presence who can be counted on to shake up our lazier thinking. With Chris Nichols, we're delighted to have gained a colleague much too lively ever to adorn a wall as a moose head. Chris's gifts are many, and the energy with which he expends them for the collective good have immediately become an example to all of us. Not the least of his talents is his ability to convene an audience of this kind. We have here students, specialists in American history and foreign policy, from inside academia and from beyond, alumni, curious colleagues from a host of disciplines, long-standing and new friends of Ohio State, Columbus cultural partners, whom Chris has been clever enough to discover in his first two weeks here, perhaps, and on Zoom, a coast-to-coast -coast wave of colleagues and interlocutors. Gatherings like this are especially precious in the wake of the pandemic, but they're also simply too rare in American society, and they are central to the mission of a public university. We are really grateful to have Chris Nichols embodying the commitment to education for citizenship that both Ralph Marchand and Woody Hayes so strongly stood for. This is the commitment that the friends of Woody sought to perpetuate in endowing this chair, and we are deeply thankful to them for giving the Marchand Center this anchor to its own mission. I now turn it over to Divisional Dean of Arts and Humanities, Dana Renga, who will introduce our speaker.
Now you get to watch yourself speak. That'll be fun. <laughs> to introduce Christopher Nichols for this inaugural slash installation of the Wayne Woodrow Hayes Chair in National Security Studies. And I really want to thank um, one person who really worked so hard to make this happen, um, Peter Hahn, who I believe is here. <laughs> um, this was a wonderful recruitment effort that really paid off, and, and um, Peter, as Dean of Arts and Humanities, just worked miracles to make this happen. And yay, thank you. Um, so today, Chris is going to speak on um, In Search of Monsters to Destroy, A Brief History of the Idea of US, US National Security, which sounds like a very ambitious but very enticing title. So Professor Christopher, Christopher McKnight Nichols was born and raised in New York City and is a lifelong and die-hard, long-suffering New York Mets fan and baseball history of the Leonardo. And he has lots of great baseball stories that you could hold in for the reception later or um, for the Q&A possibly. And he intends to write a baseball history book one day and develop a baseball history class at Ohio State, which I think would be incredibly exciting and very um, popular with our students. And this kind of ties in with his first degree, a BA in American Studies at Wesleyan, before completing the MA and PhD in history from the University of Virginia. And before joining Ohio State last summer, Chris was on the faculty of Oregon State, where he did many, many, many things, and a few highlights were directing the Humanities Institute, and was the founding director and the organizer of the other OSU Citizenship and Crisis Initiative. Every time I was reading, I was like, OSU, I was like, it's so <laughs> A committed, innovative teacher and mentor, Chris is taught throughout the curriculum and is already offering some amazing courses for Ohio State with others in development, and thank you for that. And of course, the development is super exciting. He's received awards and honors for his teaching and mentoring and is consulting editor for the massively popular Gilded Age and Progressive Era Digital Teaching Resource. I'm very pleased to see that Chris is already actively involved in graduate and undergraduate mentoring and advising at OSU in the form of postdoctoral mentoring for Mershon, serving on doctoral committee and undergraduate theses. Chris's service record is remarkable and speaks to his dedication to the many communities with whom he engages. Like, um, like with his teaching and service, he has received awards and honors. To state a few examples of literally, I'm not kidding, hundreds, um, he's already jumped right into serving Ohio State as chair of the Committee on the U.S. Bicentennial for History, to Oregon State, his vast service record, which is three pages single-spaced, includes chairing the Provost Lecture Committee, I thought appropriate for this event, and his service to the profession includes um, much reviewer work for the NEH and a proud member of the Board of Trustees of the Oregon Historical Society. And in the words of his chair, Scott Levi, he says, already in his first year, Chris is an enthusiastic departmental citizen. He actually seems to enjoy serving the department and the university community. <laughs> Chris is an internationally recognized scholar who specializes in the history of the United States and its relationship with the rest of the world, particularly with regards to isolationism, 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 internationalism, and globalization. He's an expert on the modern U.S. intellectual history, 
and has an impressive publication ranking, which includes the monograph pu published Promise and Peril, published in Peril, it's like probably my <laughs> Promise and Peril, America at the Dawn of the Gilded Age, that's out of Harvard, UP, and another manuscript, Republican Revival, the election of 1952, Tact, Eisenhower, and the Conservative Isolation coming out with Oxford University Press. He's also um, had done four edited volumes, Columbia, Oxford, Wiley Blackwell, and again, Oxford, 22 articles and book chapters, and more than 50 shorter pieces in the form of essays, reviews, and entries. Chris is a very impressive record as a public intellectual with close to 50 pieces for popular audiences, and he has given more than 200 media presentations and interviews. And again, as Scott underlines, Chris shows an extraordinary commitment to producing excellent scholarship and elevating the national conversation by bringing that scholarship to the public. And I was just talking to one of Chris's colleagues um, uh, during the reception who said, I'm not gonna quote, perfectly that Chris is a great example of kind of a um, publicly engaged scholar and is already very excited that you're here and working with the department in many ways. I could go on, but I feel I must add a few funny, fun scholarship facts. He was once ranked as the 124th historian on social media. I don't know what that means, but that's really impressive. And along uh, those lines, he once published a book recognized uh, amongst the most overlooked books of the year by Huffington Post, which I think is probably a really good book, right? <laughs> um, his stature and his disciplines is underlined by having received many prestigious fellowships, which include the um, Andrew Carnegie Fellow, um, which is about a $200,000 grant, and most recently, um, the Richard Lunsbury Foundation grant, and he has won several awards and honors for his exemplary service, teaching, scholarship, and engagement. And a few fun facts. Um, he loves dogs, but currently he doesn't have one, but we think we can remedy that soon. And he loves baking granola and eating it. And one final set of chair words from Scott, that says Chris is an incredibly incredible source of energy and wonderful dedication to working towards generating positive change. I wish that I could clone him. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, welcome to your inaugural installation of the podcast. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I really thought it was a joke, and then it would be something related to what he did. Where's the football or the, the sideline punch? I mean, this metal would have a lot of possibilities. Um, but uh, thank you so much for the kind introductions. Um, those are fantastic, and I don't even feel like I was hearing about myself. Someone else sounds very impressive. I'll try to live up to what you all had to say. Um, I, so thank yous are in order to begin uh, before I actually get into some content that hopefully will keep you um, very interested. Uh, first of all, thanks to Dean Horn, um, Dean Ranga, and Dory Noyes for those, those beautiful uh, introductions. Um, but also, thanks especially to the great team at the Mershon Center. One of the things that immediately became clear to me coming here, having run a center of my own at Oregon State, uh, was just how fantastic this team is. So Danny Wallerman, Kyle, Andy, just a fantastic team who make things happen every day. The same is also true in the history department. Um, they didn't sponsor this, Mershon did, right? <laughs> so uh, thanking uh, the Mershon team right now, but um, it's really wonderful to be in with this group. And then the larger group of scholars, and thinkers, and students who are part of the intellectual community. This is what really attracted me to coming to work to, from Oregon State to Ohio State. Um, and, and it's so fulfilling to be here with other folks who are dedicated to great scholarship, great teaching, and great outreach and I mean, this is our mission, and we're doing it beautifully, and, and I'm, I'm happy to be part of that team. Um, and speaking of wonderful places to be, I really want to thank uh, you all here in this space, uh, in the Faculty Club, and all the fantastic people who helped bring about the Woody Hayes Chair. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing in my career to, the, to this point, until the day I die, I will keep doing this, is being an advocate for history and humanities. 
how important understanding in humanistic ways the world around us is, and then that helps us to understand and shape hopefully a better future. And if you think about how you get faculty to places, it takes resources, uh, it takes you know negotiations, uh, it takes support, and it takes a whole community. It takes a village, right? Um, and so I really want to thank those who knew Woody, Woody's family, all the 800 or so donors who came together. Very often these kinds of chairs are just a few big donors. This is very rare and something really worth celebrating. Um, that, and so I'm honored to be the Hayes Chair, and I'm honored that this kind of chair exists here, and I would hope that everybody listening and everybody in the room is thinking about how they can be part of the next things like this, because that is so important for the future of higher ed. In a moment where the pandemic has made clear, higher ed is in some trouble, right? Some, there are plenty of people out there who have uh, maligned what we do, uh, and we do amazing things to the best of our ability, sometimes under resourced. But anyway, I don't I could go on and on about how, how, how much I care about this, but I just want to thank those who gave the Hayes Chair, say how honored I am to be part of it, and hopefully that there will be more things like this for faculty, for students, for staff to come. Um, so since, uh, in thinking about this event, I, I, I immediately uh, gravitated to, um, let's see, of course, we, we got to do text like sharing my screen. There we go. So I, I gravitated to thinking about um, a title of the talk that would engage with the title of the chair. Uh, and this isn't necessarily my main body of research. I was talking to some folks uh, here earlier. Um, I work on the role of ideas, as you heard, in US foreign relations, uh, isolationism, internationalism, globalization. Uh, you know, one of the first things that I kind of cut my teeth thinking about as a scholar and thinker was on how ideas about isolation came up in the late 19th century or the earliest 20th century and were modernized and updated in the American context to meet different challenges for the nation as it grew in commercial and cultural power and military possibilities. And national security is part of that equation, as I hope I will be able to show you today. Um, but it, national security wasn't central to how I analyzed this questions in the past, but I thought as part of what Mershon is doing this year and in coming years, I thought it'd be useful for us to come together as a community and interrogate questions of security, international security, international security studies. S security studies itself is a field. I'm coming at this from a historical perspective. We can talk about that in Q&A, a little bit more about what that means. Um, but I wanted us to think together briefly about the idea of national security. What does that mean? Uh, why is it significant? Uh, where did it come from? Uh, perhaps, where is it headed? So one of the things that it's, it seemed to me in, in thinking about the subject that would be useful for us to start with uh, is the fact that nobody in this room has lived in a US in which national security was not a major political and rhetorical issue, question, or cudgel. No one had. The popularization of the term came in the 1930s, it really rose in the 1940s, and ever since then, we have lived in a national security state in the US. And the world has reflected some of those concerns from the US, whether they're through threat perception, whether they're through the ideological parameters of how Americans perceive their role in the world as it changed over this, this time. So uh, though the phrase uh, national security uh, was not widely used until the Second World War, uh, in fact, one scholar has shown that Yale undergrads were debating what the US's national security might be uh, in terms of fostering domestic industries as far back as the 1790s. The national security has been out, um, but it hasn't often been used. It hasn't been uh, framed in the way that we now think of it. And so part of this brief history of national security is to give us a sense together here of where it came from, where those ideas came from, how they changed over time, and perhaps then what some of the permutations are today. Um, so the, it was really the 1930s, the Depression era conditions of that period, um, along with sort of a, a set of other concerns about national interests that generated what we think of today as national security and a national security state. It was the Depression, it was the tumult in the world of the 1930s, a little bit similar to our moment in the present, in fact rising isolationism, concerns about US global engagement, an economic downturn perhaps, rising xenophobia, violence throughout society. There's some similarities. 
So this era, the 1930s, was one in which this began. It, it really amplified uh, in terms of the arguments that were advanced prior to 1941 in the US going to Germany, Japan, and then from there took off. And I'll, I'll talk, talk this through a little bit more with some hopefully great slides and declassified documents. We can really look at some of this stuff. Uh, but uh, Walter Lippmann in 1943 defined it as follows. A nation has security when it does not have to sacrifice its legitimate interests to avoid war, uh, and it's able, if challenged, to maintain its legitimate national interests um, by war. So war or hard power really frames these mid-century, mid-20th century understandings of national security. Um, but one of the things I want to emphasize in my talk uh, that fits with how scholars have talked about this before uh, is the non-military dimension kind of affective dimensions, the ways that threat perception and fear also fit into understanding of security. So I want to emphasize insecurity as well as security. I want us to think about how we have internalized discourses of fear, how fear is implicated into understandings of national security. We need to think no farther back than 9-11 for anyone in this room who is around for 9-11 to understand how a disproportionate sense of fear shaped U.S. national security coming out of the conflict. Why did people in Terre Haute, Indiana, when I was there researching in 2002 and 2003, feel so fearful that they would be the subject of the next terrorist attacks? I worked in the Twin Towers in 2000. I grew up in New York City. I had reason to be fearful. Why in Terre Haute, Indiana, did they have those same fears? Why did they have those same fears on the coast of Oregon or in the middle of Ohio? Part of that is how the national security state has operated. Part of that is a worldview or an ideological mindset. And part of that is how we as human beings interact with threat perception. So there's a lot to unpack in this kind of story, and as any good historian would do, I'm gonna take you way back. I'm not gonna start then. I'm gonna first give us a second to think about full security. Is there a way to eliminate what's on top? Uh, yeah. So this is a uh, recently declassified document from the NSA. Um, the NSA had, the National Security Agency, NSA, thank you. Um, and the NSA had uh, posters all over its physical site um, to make sure that its workers thought about security. Uh, go figure, the NSA needed that, right? Uh, so these were declassified in 2018. I have three or four of these, they're great. Um, and thanks especially to Maxine Wagenhofer who helped me do some of the research for this. She's the inaugural Hayes Chair uh, Graduate Research Associate and has been doing that fantastic job. Uh, so the, the concept of full security is what scholars uh, like my friend and colleague Andrew Preston at Cambridge have argued are essential to understanding national security as an ideology in the U.S. or a doctrine. Uh, that it's not until the 1950s and 1960s that you get a vision of full security. Now, what does that mean? Well, one element of that is that there's a kind of illusion in American public life that we can be fully secure. And you can think back into the 9-11 moment if you want, you just go shopping, don't worry about it, the sort of uh, semi-apocryphal but actually quite accurate version of what George Bush said. Um, th this kind of vision is that you can and should have full security. There are lots of manifestations of this in our lives, from security systems and Apple, and you know, surveillance to the Second Amendment. There are lots of ways in which Americans think that they can and should defend themselves and they should have full security in their lives, including in lots of these uh, NSA documents, silence, uh, vigilance. Right? This is the kind of language that you see uh, every minute, every man, every day. And they all almost always harken back to re a revolutionary or militaristic kind of model to think about this. It's really fascinating. So full security. You know, if you were living in the 19th century, the early 19th century, would you have had any belief that you should have full security in your life? It would have been foreign to those human beings. I mean, my colleagues who study your earlier eras would have, I'm sure, all nod and agree that you would never have thought that you'd have full security in the 17th century, the 16th century, right? So it's a very much of a modern 20th century phenomenon that American policymakers and citizens buy into a kind of vision of full security. But where does this come from? Well, there's some, some echoes, some early, um, some early manifestations uh, that I would argue are worth us all of these. What we're forward on. Having gotten rid of that, and now we're going to do that. Slide four. Oh, wow. All right. Hurry up. All right. So I'm taking us back. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I guess 
they don't give tech awards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm taking us back to John Adams. John Quincy Adams uh, taking us back to 1821. It's the title of the talk. Uh, John Adams, the first, uh, the, the first president who was the son of a president, uh, ama amazing figure, one of the most qualified to hold office, diplomat, secretary of state. Uh, later in life, after he loses the presidency in 1828, he goes home, wants to retire to his farm, gets elected to Congress, lives out the rest of his life, literally suffers a stroke in the Capitol and dies two days later in the 1840s, uh, vaunted abolitionist. Uh, interestingly, uh, as some of my grad students in my class are here know, interestingly, a proponent of British Empire, late in his life as well, so a paradoxical figure. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm taking us back to John Quincy Adams um, so that we can dive into thinking together about mo the monsters to destroy. Uh, and uh, and I, I wanted to pause just to give you, for those in the sort of more popular audience who want to leave with something, he's the first president who was voted. 1848, 1849. It's pretty dour. Uh, and when you think about him in this moment, uh, July 4th, 1821, here he is in, in the House of Representatives. It, uh, and I should say, July 4th used to be a day that Americans read the Declaration and interrogated its principles and came together and gave toasts and thought long and hard about what it meant to be democratic citizens and how they could do a better job. And now we just, what do we do? Grill, drink, that kind of thing? Uh, uh, in any case, so he comes there, he's asked uh, by the citizens of Washington, D.C. to uh, read the declaration and be the main speaker. Um, so he, he comes there, as the, as the reports note, he comes, he comes there, he sits down before 11, he's, he's, he's garbed out in his, his, in his Harvard uh, attire, full professorial attire, the Washington Gazette says that he's appropriately um, fitted out either as a barrister or a professor to give this speech. Uh, he gets up and he gives one of the most famous speeches uh, in U.S. foreign policy history, uh, and one that I'm going to uh, show you is slightly different from how virtually everybody else remembers it. I've checked <laughs> my footnotes more than once. Uh, so he, he comes uh, and gives this speech on the limits of U.S. power, and, and, the, and the crux of it is that in the context of the 1810s and 1820s, when there's roiling revolutions in, in South America, when the shackles of monarchy, uh, the shackles to some extent that the American Protestants would have thought of, did, as, of the papacy, were being thrown off, Adams needs to help chart a path forward for the U.S. The U.S. at this point is weak and not strong. The U.S. is vulnerable. Talk about threat perception. Uh, there is a lot of fear. The U.S. has just come out of the War of 1812, concluded in 1815. There is still a thought that the British might the Holy Alliance out there, of the Russians, the Prussians, the Austrians. There's some French who seem to be threats. And someone like Adams, who's a skeptic, who wants to cherish and safeguard the American Republic through the sort of the over or around the shoals that might uh, ground the ship of the Republic, uh, makes this argument that, in fact, whenever the standard of freedom and independence uh, has been unfurled, the US will, uh, in her heart, her benedictions and her prayers be there with those who, uh, who are fellow travelers in Republicans. But what she won't do is go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. I'm sure you've heard this, very dead audience. Uh, and this, of course, is the precursor to the Monroe Doctrine. It's an argument for a kind of American grand strategy to expand across the continent. It's part of uh, the invisibility of indigenous peoples and groups. It's part of this thinking that the U.S. has a manifest destiny, as was uh, phrase was coined in the 1840s, a way of understanding a, a kind of broader set of security concerns for the U.S. What was it? National interest. How was national interest best safeguarded? Stay out of foreign entanglements uh, and uh, stick to the old traditional policies of Washington and Jefferson. That's the kind of vision. Uh, and you know, in some ways, um, this has stuck with us to the present day. Uh, this is often argued by intellectual historians of U.S. foreign relations to be uh, the archetypal version of a kind of exemplar version of the U.S. So if you think about the U.S.'s foreign relations in a binary perspective, which is simplistic, so we can run with that for a minute, right? you've got the exemplar U.S. of the city on the hill in the 17th century, and you've got the crusader state, interventionist state, uh, the city on the hill comes to you. And what in this moment, 
John Quincy Adams is, is doing, is putting out there, he's putting his chips on the table and suggesting the US should be more of an exemplar. Uh, and part of what he's just negotiated is a deal with uh, Spain, uh, the Adams Bonus Treaty or Transcontinental Treaty, uh, which will allow the US to get Florida. And, and they're waiting for the Spanish um, to agree to it uh, because there's uh, problems within the Spanish government, there's a revolution going on. Uh, and so this moment is one of caution and skepticism. There are other voices in American pol foreign policy and politics at this time, people like Henry Clay, the famous Speaker of the House, uh, soon to be Secretary of State, and kind of Faustian bargain that brings in Andrew Jackson and populists who want an American system to stay put. They want to ally with the newly revolutionary Republican governments of Central and South America. And, and what Adams is saying is no, that, that, that path is too difficult. That is not the right way to go. But what I want to reveal to you today, not that this is enormous, but it's a really fascinating thing, uh, is that it's not what he says. In his original document, he said, not, but she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy, but rather, but she has no political quixoticism in her composition. This is his hand, this is his draft. What you saw was the pamphlet that he uh, that he edited, agreed to, uh, and published a few months later and sent out widely. So he endorsed this pamphlet version. In the moment, on July 4th, 1821, that's what he said. We, what historians do? We go to the text, right? We bring the receipts. You want to see what happened? We show you. Thank you, Massachusetts Historical Society. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah Giorgini, president of the U.S. Intellectual History Society. Uh, so uh, what does that mean? Well, we've got a smart audience, and, and it's good to be uh, discursive in these things. So tell me, what do you think? What's the difference here? What's exoticism mean to you? Well, while you're pondering that, I'll just say it's a very popular term, <laughs> early 19th century. Uh, you see it quite often. And the monsters piece, too, was something that was meant uh, to tap into sensibilities of the US about uh, European power politics and corruption in, in Europe. That, uh, any reader, any listener would have been thinking about the kind of tentacles of, of an octopus or, or the horrors of, of European monstrosity getting into invested or involved in the US. So, what's that? Heroism against you know. Heroism against you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Other thoughts on this? Tilting at windows. <laughs> what did you say? Tilting at windows. Tilting at windows. Yeah, right. So it comes from Cervantes, it comes from Don Quixote, 17th century, right? Tilting at windmills. It's this kind of romantic pursuit, perhaps deeply mistaken, perhaps only partly mistaken, uh, idealistic. Uh, so let's let's unpack it together for just another minute, right? So what's the distinction? Why does it matter that I would say juxtapose monsters to destroy and with dogs? They both go abroad. They both go abroad. So it's, it's certainly outward facing. Yeah. Right. So quixoticism would, would imply or suggest targets that aren't really there. Whereas the monsters, potentially, if you take it at face value, the monsters exist. They're out there. They're external, right? So that early definition that I gave about uh, national security being premised on preventing external threats from getting to, the, to, to an internal audience, even by war, or undermining national interests. That's crucial to this distinction. And what, what I want to suggest is that from 1821 on, this strand, sort of a double helix, it is, is kind of how you see permutations of these debates unfold. On the one hand, you have arguments about a kind of, is this idealism in the world naive or problematic? Think Woodrow Wilson. Think about this world-shaping mission. Think, George W. Bush, right? You can bring freedom to all kinds of places in the world uh, you know, through US coercion and co-optation. And then on the other end, you can think of the monsters to destroy peace, right? Whether it's real or imagined, but it presumes to some extent that the monsters are real out there. It's either a caution or it's a call to arms. Think Pearl Harbor, right? the Japanese threat, the Nazi threat, right? Uh, these are the kinds of Examples. Now they're not, they're sort of in the eye of the beholder, but it's a really interesting strand of thought to unpack at least briefly as we talk through this. So now invest in that as you think about the fear factor. This is what I want us to talk through a little bit more as I run through this brief history. So you have quixoticism and monsters as sort of uh, juxtaposed. 
security and insecurity, right? So how can you be secure if you're fearful? Uh, so in that moment, the British had just burned Washington, D.C. They had burned the Capitol. So with an immediate reference for somebody like Adams is let's not get into another conflict with a country that could take over the nation's capital and burn it. There was very good reason to be fearful in that period. Now, some scholars have emphasized uh, that you're moving from the 1820s to the 1830s uh, more rapidly into an era that C. Van Woodward called free security that the U.S. enjoyed through the late 19th century, particularly through uh, the advantages of the British Navy, a capacity to do what it wanted in the hemisphere. In some ways, that's what the Monroe Doctrine winds up being. You think about whatever you know about gunboat diplomacy, U.S. involvement in uh, customs and receivership in, in, on islands in the, in the Caribbean. But I also want to ground that in this set of fear, real and imagined. Historians now suggest the Holy Alliance would never have attacked the U.S. But if you read the papers of Adams and all of those he's talking to, they're very fearful that if the U.S. acknowledges uh, the revolutionary republics in South America, something terrible could happen. Europe might intervene. And so we need to keep that in mind. And as we do that, we can think forward through time to other manifestations of this. So here, we've got a classic duck and cover from 1952, right? the fear of nuclear Armageddon and the kind of illusions of finding security. Right? No one reasonable ever thought that ducking under, under a desk would save you from nuclear fall. No, of course not. But if in part, in managing the inherent insecurity in a national security project, you need to do that kind of work. You project that to kids. You project that generationally. It's an ideological kind of mission that then goes, becomes instantiated in, in all sorts of elements of, of cultural production, films, right, documentaries, practices, daily daily habits, all kinds of things. All right, so I'm gonna run us through this brief history now, um, I, I promise. So, the myth and reality of free security. I love this term, free security. My colleague, Andrew Preston, who wrote the, the best article on this subject, uh, talks about this extensively. What I wanna also emphasize is empire. So a big part of thinking about what comes after Adams is not that the U.S. is not engaged with the world, but that it's engaging with the world on its own terms. The monsters to destroy moment, the quixotic mission moment, um, what's happening under this is the U.S. is circumscribing around the hemisphere a kind of set of movements, and I mean the U.S. in a broad sort of way, the many kinds of actors, peoples and groups, merchants and citizens, uh, abolitionists and, and slave uh, power advocates, pushing the U.S throughout the hemisphere uh, on a course towards uh, an empire of liberty, liberty as, as Jefferson used to put it. Uh, and what I want to emphasize here is you see this is, this is a mural in the U.S. Capitol from 1862. Uh, this is, uh, as you, if you look up there, westward uh, the country takes, um, or I have it there, right? Take the, uh, the, the course of empire takes its way. Uh, so you, you can see manifested in 1862 in the course of the Civil War a kind of uh, civilizational mission dimension of a nation uh, theoretically circumscribing which monsters it's, it's attacking. But of course, part of that project is uh, also one of monster making, I would argue, right? And so who's ruled out of this? If you think of the other iconic images of westward expansion, John Gass has one from 1872, for instance, Lady Liberty, uh, moving across, uh, it often comes with technology, it comes with weapons, it comes with uh, sort of Western ideals. It comes with uh, books labeled Bible. Uh, and at the end of the day, almost always on the outside are indigenous peoples and groups or empty territory. So what was Adams really doing within that moment? He was perpetuating a kind of foreign policy vision that was about national interest. And the national interest was filling the continent, essentially. Uh, was the kind of expansion across the continent before the US was capable of taking those next steps. But what, what else was going on in national interest? So this is where we get the rub. The fear doesn't disappear. The insecurity remains within the nation state and within the ideologies about foreign policy. Here you see um, the, the great fear of the period that Uncle Sam may be swallowed by foreigners, the problem solved. On the left there, you see an Irish immigrant. On the right, you see a Chinese immigrant. In the middle, you see the paths of technology. Uh, you see railroads, you see canals, you see the, the route forward for a merchant U.S. developing that vibrant empire, that economy, that industry that's going to make it the power that all these figures hope it will be, right? Uh, and the problem gets solved uh, as Uncle Sam is eaten first 
uh, by the this racist imagery, by the Irishman and the, and the Chinese man, and then in the end, uh, you get a, 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 an amalgam of the two images, right? Obviously xenophobic, obviously racist. But what you're finding in this film is just to think through this progression is national interest in our channel to find internal enemies. Probably don't need to think too hard to think about why I'm putting that in this conversation. As you think through the rise of national security questions, internal enemies are essential to understanding the broader di dimensions of what national security entails and, uh, and who and what get vilified when you think about the nation's security. And when it gets operationalized in government, corporate-led, universities, you can pick all kinds of things. So when you, for me, the, the most important moment, uh, this will not surprise anybody uh, who knows my work, some of the people who've already introduced me have a sense of this, the most important moment in understanding the series of changes that gives rise to um, the national security paradigm as we now know it is the late 19th century. That at the end of the 19th century, the US, uh, for the first time, self-conscious American policymakers, citizens, intellectuals, activists, uh, writers, artists, for the first time self-consciously grappled with the fact that they now have a sufficient world power to go out in search of monsters to redefine what those quixotic adventures might be, and to debate Debate the terms of US engagement. So if you, you know, a glance at the statistics uh, helps to illuminate this. You know, if you're thinking about um, who and what made uh, this moment, the, you have, uh, the, by 1895, the US's arrival in industrial production only to Great Britain. Every other country fails in comparison. One of my favorite letters from Teddy Roosevelt uh, also found in the Massachusetts Historical Society, is when he's saying to a friend, I'll take a war with Spain in 1898, but what I want is a war with Germany. They're the next rising power. The US has to exert its power against those countries. You <coughs> cannot imagine that in the 1820s context. They were debating maybe allying with Great Britain. They were not thinking about a war with a foreign power. Coming out of the Civil War, generating all this industrial uh, power, now debating world power uh, in a world military to rival other nations, starting with the creation of a, of a navy. And there's all kinds of amazing strategic thought here. And this is just a capsule history, but you know, those, those in here probably know the, the concept of uh, the concept of Alfred Thayer Mann, uh, a proponent of sea power. There's a set of thought uh, coming out of actually John Quincy Adams' grandson, a guy named Brooks Adams, who was a writer and a thinker, who thought that the the path forward for civilizations was through industrial progress, and that was moving west. The US had to keep up, in fact, with China in this moment, although that wasn't accurate in terms of what the Chinese market was producing. But thinking in this moment, late 1890s, turn of the 20th century, was the US might be actually dropping behind if it doesn't speed up, build a modern military, perhaps uh, generate a standing army. So that's another interesting dimension of this. How does the US become a militarized national security state? by fits and starts. Because those older ideas, from Adams going back to Washington and Jefferson, um, are very much there. So what's interesting in this moment, we see Teddy Roosevelt, the new diplomacy is up there, and his army's holding arbitration. You see international law uh, significantly stepping into these new ideas about what national interest meant and where the US would play a part. Uh, this is by no coincidence, coming out of the judge in 1904, 1905. This is uh, when the Russo-Japanese War was being um, negotiated. This is where Teddy Roosevelt wins the Nobel Peace Prize. In fact. But it's at this moment of the US stepping onto the world stage as an arbiter of peace is an interesting dimension. Is that, uh, does that perhaps pass the Adams quixotic composition test? It may be idealistic, it may be going around the world, but it may in fact be a manifestation of a limited US foreign policy doing good. Right? Not seeking a monster, but actually sort of doing this idealistic kind of project you could imagine coming out of that Adam's era. All right, but then we need to step forward, or keep enough moving, we're now in the World War I moment, and thinking about uh, Woodrow Wilson. So Wilson, of course, famously said uh, that the US uh, should make the world safe for democracy. This is clearly a step beyond those earlier manifestations. No doubt about it. Uh, as you look at this uh, piece of war propaganda, how did the US pay for the war? How did the US pay for wars in the past? Not through debt like we have now, or differently through debt. Uh, our economist friends, maybe we can talk, talk through the differences between uh, liberty loan drives 
uh, and, and our current debt financing of conflicts. But in any case, um, keep these uh, off, sorry, uh, off the USA by more liberty bonds. The US supported the war effort through funders and through patriotic funding and through making a case, uh, the Wilson administration made a very strong case that, uh, that the war was for generating a better world beyond. We see very few examples like this where the threat seems likely to come to the US. Now, there were counterintelligence operations, there was a committee on public information, public intelligence, they propagandized the American public. There's a lot of ways in which it wasn't as simple as I might be suggesting. But what I'm saying is that the US did not have significant threat perception at the, at the uh, foreign policy level. The Lusitania was sunk, there were a host of ways in which uh, commerce was interdicted, uh, neutral trade was problematized, but the US was not likely to be attacked. So you had to find a different path forward if you were thinking about this set of ideologies. Where does national interest go? Uh, and, and where does national security start? Is the US under threat from those external forces? Again, remember that definition early on. Uh, and you, your answer has to be, Wilson only got you part of the way. It does not pass the quixotic test. It did get the US into the war. But the most interesting question about that is, why did it take so long for the US to get into the conflict? And I spent eons studying World War I, so I'd be happy to spend the whole rest of our Q&A time about World War I. But from 1914 to 1917, the US doesn't join the war. Why? The older ideas, I would argue. Ideas about not being entangled with power politics in Europe. Uh, holding US ground uh, against foreign uh, in fact, one of the problems in the early years was that, that the foreign war was uh, making it impossible for the U.S. to trade with all the other, other parties. The U.S. declared neutrality and thought it should be able to trade with all the religions. And they were having blockades and keeping the U.S. out. So, it's, so the national interest was, uh, was troubled only by the fact that other nations weren't abiding by neutral laws the U.S. understood, not attacking the U.S. It was not a defense of One interesting other component of this is that there was, for the first time, a national security league in this period. So the first time you see a lobby organization during the war lobbying for preparedness. So arguing that Americans need to train. You see this with uh, Teddy Roosevelt and a number of other people around him. Republicans were really concerned with uh, being ready for the war when it came in, in this moment. And so a national security league formed. And then coming out of the war, they worried a lot about something that then becomes really important in the Depression, which I already foreshadowed economic security. So one of their big concerns morphs into a question of economic security. How will that be uh, perpetuated, maintained? Are there external threats to that? So here's where the rubber hits the road. It's the 1930s when you really become, begin to understand what the modern ideas about national security are, where they come from, and, and what they mean. Um, you know, in the period before that, between uh, World War I and 1931, um, a, a scholar has noted uh, that there were only four times that a, that a president uttered the words national security, and almost always as a kind of rhetorical flourish. After 1931, you start to see national security come up a lot more. There's a, a, we, we throw out some, uh, there's a great article in The Atlantic that has a Google engram on this, for instance. So you can think about word use as signifying ideological changes and their, and their importance. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that in second fireside chat, just in 1933, so in still in the first 100 days of his presidency, FDR, in dealing with the cataclysm of the New Deal, starts arguing for the imperatives of national security. That national security begins at home. That national security is about making sure that people have a roof over their head and have food on their table. Uh, and this is a transformation of national security ideas. Again, right? Like that full security idea that no 19th century or 18th century American would have possibly understood, this is a new orientation of ideas about national security. In fact, when uh, in 1940 and 41, the US is about to get into the war, one of the most fascinating things that FDR does is in his Arsenal of Democracy speech, he says this isn't a, a dialogue about war. This is not a conversation about war. It's a conversation about national security before the U.S. is involved in it. It's just after he's been reelected. That's what he's putting out on the table, that the war is not about the war, it's about U.S. national security. And so from this FDR moment forward, to build on that sort of Wilsonian element and other aspects, <laughs> you get this kind of war freedoms uh, orientation. So like I said, you know, if you're looking at this progression over time, uh, the insecurity here is about what can happen at home in an economic crisis. 
it, it, it's about what can spill over from foreign broils. Um, but it's also something really radical, and that's why I highlighted it up there. The third of the four freedoms. So you have your the freedom of speech, you've got your freedom uh, of worship, uh, you've got your freedom from want, and your freedom from fear. So here we get fear in there yet again, right? Uh, but I want to emphasize the want part, because that's the most radical. The freedom from want, which will secure to every nation, so not just the US, to every nation, a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. It's globally transformation. It's a US national security project that in turn is one for the world. And it's one that a lot of Americans might want in a moment of depression, but plenty also disagree with. That this is, like Herbert Hoover would have said, that this is fundamentally anathema to American individualism. That this is a step too far. And, and his FDR's opponents hated, hated this. What you see out of this moment into the Truman era is a kind of reification of this. Uh, there's Truman signing the National Security Act in 1947. Truman uh, pushes this forward. So this, as, as the scholar Liz Borgward argued, this new deal for the world becomes the US's mission at the World War II. Uh, and it's really happening in the policy planning during the war, lots of scholars have talked about. Um, so Truman in 1947, he issues uh, his so-called Truman Doctrine, and that's to support free peoples everywhere on the planet. Again, totally outside the bounds of a Washington and Jefferson or John Quincy Adams, right? That the U.S. would be the would be the backstop of freedom for individuals in Greece or in Turkey. And by the time of Eisenhower's doctrine uh, in 1957, 58, that that is extended around the world. That now that pledge now exists in the Middle East. So by the end, within a decade of this, the U.S. has pledged to extend its own national security bubble to free peoples around the world. That's how transformative the logic, the language. The thinking about national security became in this period. Another way to conceptualize that um, is to think about what happened in 1947 itself. You have the, as he signs this National Security Act in 1947, you get a National Security Council, the NSC. You get a group of people, a group of commitments, you get a formal central intelligence agency. You get a formal intelligence apparatus that leads to the world we live in today where presidents and vice presidents and former presidents and former vice presidents are leaving classified documents everywhere. <laughs> Right? Comes out of this moment. Classification, security. Right? You've got to secure those. You have to lock them down. Full security, you can't take it home. Right? Even if it's very empty, it still needs to be. So, in the NSC 68 moment, National Security Council 68, one of the most famous policy planning documents, highly classified until um, Kissinger declassified it about 1972, uh, is often seen as this formative moment in the construction of the Cold War state. And what I want to emphasize in, in this, uh, well, one interesting takeaway uh, for anyone who writes memos, always create three options if you're a policy planner. One that no one will accept, one that seems too extreme, and one that is the happy medium. And that's what they did. That happy medium was build up the Cold War state, fund the hell out of it, don't start a preemptive war, don't go fully re re retrenchment, uh, and there you go. That's how we wound up in 2023 with 800 bases around the world. Sorry for the flippancy, but that is the way that the memo proceeds. But what I want to emphasize is the fact that it's remarkably ideological, is remarkably um, humanistic, uh, like a lot of these documents actually are. Uh, what it's emphasizing here is only by practical affirmation abroad as well as at home uh, of our system, political and economic. The, 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 the national security planners, Paul Mitzi, was the primary author of this, uh, were thinking about the assaults on free institutions worldwide as an extension of uh, national security problems at home. So there's people within the US attacking the US. That's a huge problem. Think, think McCarthy, right? But broader and deeper than that is the fact that American institutions, if they're threatened at home, uh, will, will wobble. And so too, institutions abroad, if they are threatened, will have a corollary effect. Of them. That there, the struggle against international communism in this moment, the struggle against other peoples and groups who are against American style freedom, which sounds like something that you would hear after 9-11, perhaps, is very much endemic in the policy planning and national security thinking of 1950. And you see that throughout these documents. You see that throughout this set of orientations. So here, what do you see? You see fused national interest and national security, and you see it global. It's now a worldwide project. In the NSA parlance, 
It goes way back. Here we go back to one of those FOIA documents. It goes back to the Patriots, right? So written into this view of national security in the 50s and 60s is a view that this was what they would have wanted. Founding fathers, framers, they wanted full security. They wanted security to be the companion of liberty. This is the kind of thinking you see in this era. Uh, and of course, historically, it's anachronistic, it's not, it's not accurate. But, in, but the, the reason I frame it this way is that, that history plays such an important role, the past plays such an important role in the understanding of national security. Who and what counts, who should be ruled in and out. So think of about xenophobia, think about people who, who might, might, not, might not be secure members of a secure state. Think about border control. Uh, think about immigration policy. There's a lot of ways in which you can roll through this conversation. And, and I'm just trying to give you a capsule history, and not write the door stop flipper. Um, but what else do we get out of this? We'll get later in the Cold War, towards the end. You get the rise of the national security strategy. Has anybody read the Biden administration's national security strategy? Taking a look? Sorry. <laughs> They, they usually come out every year, but, but presidencies are often pretty um, silly about this. In fact, they held it up. This wasn't silly, this was strategic. Uh, as the Ukraine war unfolded early last year, they did not release, they waited, they, they revised. In light of the fact that the US was going to need a more robust national security strategy that actually took account of the fact of Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine. Uh, but passed with the Goldwater Nichols Act in 1987, you wind up with an obligation for the White House to produce every year, theoretically, a national security strategy. Uh, and one of the things that's so remarkable about, the, about these documents year over year is, to some extent, they really do chart the path of the US. And they chart the path of the US and the world not at the high political level of a John Quincy Adams or a Barack, or, uh, or Barack Obama, uh, but rather they chart it through policy planning. They chart it through Paul Nitsi, they chart it through the NFC, they chart it through how you actually think through the multi-dimensional threats um, that the US poses, it, 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 uh, is challenged by in, in any given moment. You ever see Ronald Reagan's, the first freedom, peace, and prosperity, so that's what America is all about, for ourselves, our friends, and those people across the globe struggling for democracy. It doesn't exactly sound like a very programmatic policy or a strategic document, right? And here you also see in that uh, just that statement, the kind of fusing of this world changing, perhaps in the quixotic, idealistic sense, uh, a kind of vision of the U.S.'s pro proper role in the world. Reagan's view, right? U.S. leadership everywhere, for everyone. Very different, again, from that attitude. Um, and in this late Cold War moment, you get the indispensable nation. So I wanted us to be attentive as we went through this, and I hope I signaled enough of these. These key concepts come up. They're in kind of deflection points for these changes in thinking about national security uh, and national interests. So first, uh, female Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, who I had the great pleasure of interviewing just a few years before she died on page. Super impressive, amazing woman. Uh, wrote a fantastic book about fascism, uh, which, which I highly recommend. Uh, her life story as an immigrant um, is, is, is remarkable. And one of the things, though, that she projected uh, and she asked the Clinton administration to regularly put into their speeches was this concept of the indispensable nation. This, if we have to use force, it's because we're America. We're the indispensable nation, we stand tall, we see further into the future. Quite different from that Adam logic, right? So that if we had the double helix over here of the exemplar US, the Albright world is quite far away, right? Seeing far in the future, not worried about that, romantic possibility of an idealistic crusade gone wrong, but rather thinking that the US has an exceptionalist capacity to do good in the world because it can see far. Right? It's, a, it, it's a really transcendent sort of vision, but it's exactly what Adams was worried about, because it could get the US potentially into much more trouble than a more limits of power vision of not doing this. So as we kind of wrap this up, thinking about fear and threat perception and two moments in this era. So it's the crucial moment of understanding that rise of national security logic in the 1930s uh, came to a head with Pearl Harbor. The crucial moment in the post-Cold War was not lived. And the shaping of a world in which we now have apps, trade policies that are deemed national security threats comes out of this. We, we live in a world of ubiquitous national security concerns and that is because of these kinds of cataclysmic events 
that then trigger the insecurity dimension of thinking about national security. It wasn't in Adams' day the fact that the Capitol uh, was taken and fired <laughs> and destroyed largely. Uh, the genesis of the omniscient, omnipresent, ubiquitous national security was not for him, but that was about cautious realism. In the, once the U.S. has more economic and military power, the capitalist shifts, the gaze shifts, right? Uh, and so we live in a world where the environment, where military, where questions of resources, uh, where all sorts of other things fit on our homeland security system of thinking about national security. That we have these, uh, these kinds of charts, this sort of awareness, these sorts of concerns, about national security that also are framed with national interest questions, right? What is in the nation's interest to be involved in Ukraine? Think about some of the debates happening uh, in the House right now. Uh, but, uh, and also, um, it's premised on multilateralism. So another piece that I haven't played out but in a subtext here is the 19th century US unilateralism going it alone in the world has been reshaped by an orientation, particularly from the 30s to the present, and it's World War, world war II, of a, of a set of commitments to the so-called rules-based order, or a view of US multilateralism and multilateral engagement and leadership um, that has then actually led to more national security concerns, right? So if you think about the ways in which FDR was generating this new uh, uh, kind of dynamic bubble for American citizens, businesses, and others, as they go through the world, they should be fully secure, and so too should the US as allies. That's how we get to this point. That's how we get to a world, in my view, where national security is so ubiquitous uh, that it's in, it's in all aspects of our lives. So let me give you a last uh, couple parting shots. So George Bush's vision from the national security strategy of 2002 was one of uh, that, that drew together some of these transcendent ideas about freedom uh, and values, uh, a distinctly American internationalism, a distinctly American internationalism. There was a fear when he came into office that he was going to be a, quote, NATO isolationist from some journalists. We saw the opposite. He came into office hoping to be a domestic policy president, and he wound up, like so many do, becoming a foreign policy president. Uh, the aim of the strategy is to help make the world not just safer, but better. And you saw in this moment, and I read about this in the introduction to my recent book, Ideology and U.S. Foreign Policy, with my great colleague, David Milne, that one of the things you saw in this framing was something that the, the Obama administration then rejected. The framing here of this world-shaping set of ideals that was the appropriate place for the U.S., particularly after such a heinous attack, right? That the U.S.'s response to this terrorist attack could and should be the quixotic adventure, and it knew the right thing, and it wasn't quixotic, it was idealistic, it was the right thing to do. Uh, and yet, if you go to the deeper part of what I pull out of a very long document, then the greater threat, the greatest, uh, the greater the threat, the greater is the risk of inaction, the more compelling the case for taking anticipatory action to defend ourselves. One of the things that he articulated there that everybody in this smart room and everybody watching online undoubtedly knows is preemption. So the next step of national security, the next step of national interest, is to make sure that others can't bring threats to the U.S. At least in this moment. Uh, and, the, and the argument here is that in international law and American political thought, this had been actually permitted. This had been something that Americans had thought about in the past. What they allowed slightly is that when it was debated in the past, it was often, if not always, rejected. But that said, it was the clear through line from such a heinous attack on, on, on the U.S. by non-traditional, non-conventional forces. Right? So the new American internationalism would be one that would make the world, in a Wilsonian sort of sense, safe for democracy. It could export freedom ideals and that sort of thing. Um, and the flip side of the coin was the U.S. could and would enforce that to keep its homeland safe. So by the Obama administration, which rejected that ideology outright and supposedly elevated, quote, pragmatism over ideology, uh, one of the things that they did was attempt to lead the world in efforts to deter, discourage, and disrupt cyber actors. Here's just one example of many I could give about the ways in which the Obama administration also attempted transcendent projects. Uh, quite different, granted, but the same sorts of ideas were embodied in the Obama administration goals bringing peoples and groups together. His famous Cairo speech, talking about the Abrahamic faiths, uh, attempting to heal those wounds. And so you saw in this moment, though, the ideology of the Obama administration 
uh, make some serious missteps or have some blinders, and this is something um, that fits with questions of national security. For him, the pivot to Asia was about economic determinants of the That for him, thinking about the national interest was about the economic future of the US, GDP, uh, standard of living, that sort of thing. Not the ideological drivers of foreign conflict. Not about ideological agenda. So if you look to the last two decades of presidency, if you look to what was different about the Bush administration and the Obama administration, one thing I would point you to, and this deeper history suggests is interesting, is that the Bush administration had its own blinders about a kind of freedom agenda and attempting to export that. And the Obama administration had its own blinders about a focus on economic determinants that, that did not allow it to fully understand Russian aggression. That a kind of vision, historicist vision of an imperial ruse was animating them to meddle in elections, to, to annex Crimea, to, to begin to attack Georgia, and to move into something that then we didn't fully anticipate and couldn't do. Uh, so if you're thinking about some of these ideological parameters and the ways in which national security and national interests are operationalized, those are some good examples in our current world. And now, to conclude, one, one final one of these NSA uh, FOIA guys. So what kind of national security world do we live in today? Now is the time, it says, to plant security consciousness in your own mind, cultivate security consciousness in the minds of others, reap the satisfaction of doing your part in protecting our national security, intended for NSA contracts, right? But we live in a world of national security as a mentalité, for, not just for those contractors, but for our everyday lives. National security is very much in how we think, and then there's also the, all the other security dimensions. I was introduced by two deans and a director, right? We think about duo logins, multiple ways in which our security is at risk, right? The ways in which people are fishing for our messages, the, the security of your individual financing. There are lots of ways in which national, national security falls all the way down to individual responsibility. How about national security in a pandemic? Do, your, do the right thing to make sure you don't get a virus, that you don't undermine the economy. And we live in lots of ways in which national security kinds of logics come all the way down to the individual something we don't often think reflect on because they tend to operate the level of the policymakers and big statements that have been noted. The background Adam, the old man eloquent. Uh, I am still puzzled by this question of the double helix. Where is that quixotic adventure today? And where is that composition in foreign policy? Generally speaking, almost all of the national security discourse you find in think tanks and presidential level, it's pretty much bipartisan. Look at how we fund budgets for the military, for intelligence. Uh, there's very little of the pushback of the kind of beware the monsters to destroy. Just a few years ago, there was a lot of hope for pushing that conversation. Something called the Quincy Institute was founded in D.C. No coincidence, the Quincy, Quincy Institute. Founded by money from the Koch brothers and George Soros. <laughs> but where is that conversation? there really aren't articulators of this kind of vision for the US anymore. They did exist in the historical record, and I'm really intrigued by the fact that they had strong principled reasons to think this through. They articulated them really beautifully. As you saw, the difference between the quixotic composition and the monsters to destroy, both versions are really illustrative and helpful to think through some of the challenges to American democracy, and yet, where are those folks? Where is that argument in American foreign policy? We're interestingly somewhat bereft in that way. So I would challenge us all, uh, in the best sense of the Woody Hayes chair, in the best sense of interrogating security questions, of to really challenge ourselves, to think through what are the things that we're missing? What are our blind spots or blinders in trying to understand what the US should do in the world and how we can be part of that at the individual level? Well. All right, I'll leave it at that, and hopefully we can have a good conversation. <laughs>
lead to some sort of fundamental shift in thinking about national security, or do you see more continuity uh, instead? It's a great question. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, so I would say absolutely the fundamental shift is that of the early Cold War. I mean, I, I would point to 1947, 1950 very, very self consciously. Uh, and then you, you can't envision the rise of the security state, if you understand it, with all the security apparatus in the absence of a perceived significant communist state, a perceived significant Soviet state. One of the counterfactuals, as you probably know better than I do in some ways, if thinking about US Russia in, the, in those early moments, is FDR had hopes that the greater socioeconomic freedom of fear could be something that could be guaranteed through close alliance with Russia. Uh, and he hopes, uh, arguably to the day he died, that a, a rapprochement of some kind might lead to a left, left animosity, that, that there could be something like Russian security without Russian antagonism, and vice versa. Uh, and you know, when, NSC, when NSC 68 that I was talking about comes out, George Kennan, the famous architect of containment, where it didn't come out, but for, for policy planners they understood its limitations, um, he argued that this was absolutely the wrong thing that the U.S. needed to stop building up, as you undoubtedly know, stop building up its military industrial complex, but instead you know, find diplomatic means, in other words, to use the adage of fermentation, to not look for monsters or make monsters out of folks that wouldn't otherwise necessarily be antagonists, right? to, to create connections. So like, I, I can't conceive of the national security state or the national security ideology that I've described it without the early Cold War moments. But on the other hand, what I hope I've painted here is this much longer trajectory of thinking about this that suggests that some of it was bubbling up no matter what. So, you know, in that way, I guess I'm a, both a consistency and a rupture kind of thinker. The, the big rupture is the Second World War. Uh, and I think the, the main structural dimensions of that that are interesting are, are the fact that you wouldn't, before, after World War I, the U.S. demobilized so fast that, that people making calls to different war works offices in D.C. couldn't get through because the phones were cut. After World War II, that wasn't the case, right? The, the rise of the kind of garrison state, national security state after the Second World War was happening, but it didn't need to take the shape that it did. And I think national security as an ideology and, and the propaganda of the war were a big part of that. But so too, I think, was in the absence of the Second World War, uh, the Depression the, the, the socioeconomic ways in which FDR and the dealers and the brains trust thought about these things were in fact fundamentally the orientations that led to a way of converging national interest and national security in the 20th century. That's also very much with us. The, you know, the U.S. is attacked to go shop, right? A good citizen is a, is a good consumer in American society, and that comes out of thinking about um, the depression. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't show half the slides I could have, but if you think about uh, New Deal propaganda, Tons of it is about security, social security, war, uh, work progress, right? And putting putting people to work is security for the nation. Why? Otherwise, revolution. In American ideology, one of the most fascinating pieces of thinking that the intersection of domestic and foreign policy is an amazing American preoccupation with preventing revolution within America. a revolutionary country that is very much has been concerned with preventing revolution within. The Chris, thank you so much for this very impressive overview you just under an hour. Um, uh, I, as you can expect, I'd like, I'd like to ask about the very foundation transition in, in, in the story based on in America. Um, and you emphasize that Wilson represents a radical break of the previous century. Um, I'd like to ask about the international dimension of that. You know, uh, the key in Wilson's piece um, proposal was the League of Nations, right? Can we read this as the internationalization of the American national security? And of course, the 1920 rejection of the U.S. Senate um, after the Versailles Treaty and the League of Nations withdraw to the Quincy Adams uh, perspective. I, what do you make of it? Yeah. Also, a great question. I, mean, I could have pivoted the whole talk about Wilson. Uh, you know, we can stay for a while. The second hour will be all about Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> 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 So, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I think you you put your finger on something really important. In, in my view of this history, I spent a lot of time thinking about Wilson, what Wilson signified, and around the world. Uh, 
the, the national security dimensions of threat perception that I've been spelling out here are the central problem for, for why we couldn't gin up more popularity across the political spectrum in the US to support the country, to support the sort of peace that you want, um, in, in my mind. And, and, and part of that is the bedrock ideological foundations of not being entangled with other, other nations, going back to Washington and Jefferson. There's particular politics to that, of course. But, but on the global stage, I, I think what's interesting is that I, I would argue Wilson went way too far for Americans in thinking about, uh, you know, as he put it, um, equalizing the differences between large and small states. He didn't necessarily always believe that, of course. But um, that was the hope with the league. Uh, that was one of the hopes with the league. And, and that, that really, uh, we saw this at, when we founded the UN as well. Ameri there's an American carve out for American exceptionalism in international organization and international law. And the World War I moment was the trial moment for that. So just to sort of recap that history, uh, one of the sticking points for the, for the Covenant of the League of Nations here was the Article 10, which was one that would have pledged the US to fight wars theoretically, especially according to the opponents of the, of the League, uh, pledged the US to fight wars with, with allied countries, went to, to pledge to uh, maintain the territorial integrity of other countries. This seemed like it went against national interests, right? So the opponents of that, people like William Bora, the famous Idaho uh, Republican, arch uh, hyper uh, isolationist, who's called the big protease, uh, one of the greatest orators in the Senate, in fact. Um, uh, it, it, one, that was one of his main arguments. That this, this, the, the league concept was against the national interest, and, and that seems to have good, have had good staying power. But, but part of I think the reason why Wilson was received by two million people in Paris was precisely the inverse of what Americans didn't like. Right? That it was nations pledging to go against their own national interest to prevent the next war. And, and the way I often think about the 20s and 30s then is a progression not, not is best not understood as interwar years, but rather uh, you know, years that many Americans and many citizens around the world were fighting to prevent the next war. But they had no idea they were living between the wars. It was not interwar years at all. In fact, coming out of the Great War, one of the main, you know, uh, I've written a lot about this, about, about, a lot about this too, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the first two American women to win the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, they're pushing, their whole life mission is to stop the next conflict. And there's tons of chapters around the world. There's, there, there's you know, women all around the world as part of just that organization. You can look at the top of others. So I guess what I'm suggesting is there's Wilsonianism without Wilson, and as many scholars have noted, and that in the 20s and 30s, that Wilsonian project lives on. I think that's what uh, creates the kind of fertile terrain for the FDR vision. So you needed that first pass, arguably. I mean, this is this is sort of historian speculation, right? You, you need that first pass to clear the way so that Americans could then deal with the fact that a U.S.-led, U.S.-centered UN, right, on the U.S.'s own terms, with, with veto and, and some carve out for the for the World Court, could work. Uh, the Bretton Woods system and all that. Uh, so I, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but but it, it grapples with with that concern. I think Wilson is, is this crucial moment, and it's also this crucial disappointment. And then if, you, if you think about the people who are, if one thing that's been interesting to me in studying Wilson, I don't know if people in here have a strong view of Woodrow Wilson, but you'd be surprised. There are people out there who love him or hate him. And I've especially found, found Vietnam vets are really divided on Woodrow Wilson. There are Vietnam vets who blame Wilson for Vietnam. And then there are vets who say, Wilson was exactly right. This sort of world-shaping vision is what the U.S. should have invested in, and it would not have gone there. So there's folks who, who've written chapters, there's scholars who have been on that, who've written chapters about global milliers, helping the world, making the world better. It, it's quixotic vision version, where it goes wrong, and gets the U.S. involved in domino theory conflicts and all kinds of terrible stuff. And it's kind of idealistic vision that actually reshapes the world and makes things much, much better for a lot of people. Think about standard of living, all kinds of things. Um, and so the Wilson memory, the Wilson sort of imaginary that lives with a lot of us who, who have any sense of him is another fascinating component of this. And I think that is partly why you see then other versions of the intersection of national interests um, and national security uh, become more widely accepted by Americans because of the kind of 
Wilson uh, first path. I see a student who typed the first one back. I don't want to prejudge. <laughs> Not one of my colleagues in the history class. Yeah. How about that? So you were, you were right on the undergraduate. Ah. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Of course. And so I'd say I'm pretty involved with you know, politics around campus. And from the vibe I've gotten, you know, a little bit of an unprofessional, but excuse me for a second, my first year. <laughs> it seems that both sides of the political spectrum, or at least how they're represented here on the campus and what I've seen nationally, seem to be interested in strengthening the national security state just in different ways from each other, especially with all this fear about China or things that could extend beyond that or nationally. So what do you think it would take to have a shrinking national security state? Because it seems relatively unlikely right now from my perspective. That's, that's a good question. Well, I'll give you one historian's answer, which some of my fellow historians in here would say is that we know very well from the historical record how bad human beings are at predicting the future. So that's our, our get out of jail free card is always, we don't predict the future. And then I say something like, I'm willing to go with you on that. Thank you for coming out. I will honor your question with an answer if I, if I could do it. Uh, so I would say that the moments that you've seen in the, since the Cold War, right, the moments that you've seen a, a pullback of the national security state have been few and far between. Uh, and the only one that holds Handle to our present moment would be the so-called peace dividend uh, after the Gulf War and the 90s of the Clinton um, And that would require a sense that the external threats were minimal uh, and a sufficient amount of fiscal conservatism on, from both parties, all parties, the cross spectrum, however you want to think about that. Um, and even then, of course, I mean, we could get to the politics of that, that era. Very contentious. Right? In some ways, some historical political historians argue that our present moment is framed by the contentious politics of the you know, mid-90s. Uh, but in terms of a peace dividend, that is probably your moment to look back to. I cannot imagine, I mean, the way I started and ended this with the ubiquity of national security, I can't imagine a scenario where there don't appear to be more threats than the US and the US would. Uh, and another piece of this, as someone who studies ideology and ideas, and who develops ideas, that's sort of also worth mentioning, is the rise of the Cold War state, the national security state, is it, it's us. It's people who study this stuff. It's scholars. It's disciplinary knowledge. Uh, and part of perpetuating the security state is PhDs, is think tanks, is people who perceive and understand those things. It's open source intelligence. It might be the kind of thing you want. Right? And so it's, that is also self-perpetuating. There's a the whole theory of bureaucratic politics whereby you, know, you start something like Homeland Defense and then you get an even bigger and even bigger and even bigger department right? and without stop. Like, why would you stop Homeland Defense? Don't you believe in Homeland Defense? Don't you believe in national security? Take off your shoes at the airport. Do you have any liquids in it? Right? That, will that go on for the rest of our lives? It could. Has it been proven to be, you know, at best, minimally effective? Also that, right? So, you know, I, I don't mean to be naturally more optimistic, but I, but I think that the reality is that the national security state is so entrenched uh, in, the U, in the U.S. government that you can't envision a scenario where we're outside of it. I think the only thing that you might say, just to give us sort of a pause, is the ways in which national security is written into apps and is, is written to other aspects of our lives doesn't have to be. So I could imagine corporations of technology um, that changes our relationships somewhat to the ubiquity of uh, national security questions. And, 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 but, um, but that too, I have to be bad about. I think sort of uh, Foucaultian panopticon constant surveillance is sort of the likely future for humanity, unfortunately. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that, that illusion of security, right? You can, you can view everything, you can see everything, like CCTV in England. And you still can have blind spots and people can figure out ways to get through that, still can assassinate foreign nationals and get away. Right? So even with ubiquitous surveillance, you can still not be fully secure. You can't have that thing that people in the Cold War aspire to. So I suppose the other way to think about it would be maybe you go back to the 17th century sensibility. You go back to a world in which you don't have the illusion of being fully secure.
perhaps uh, that long vision is, well, one last question, and then we will bring it up to, uh, to make formal okay. conversation. Okay, sounds good. All right, one last question. I see you in. Thanks, Chris. Um, that was a great talk. You're, you're really tremendous up there. Thank you. That's why I me unhappiness is watching you. It makes me realize how much harder it just got for the rest of us to win teaching awards. <laughs> so if you could dial it down a little bit, that'd be much appreciated. Um, so, a wonderful talk. But I'd ask you to speculate on the difference between political rhetoric and, politi and politics in general on one hand versus genuine ideology on the other. And I'm specifically thinking, you talked a lot about the early period, early Cold War, the Truman years. So sure, Truman proclaims a global doctrine, but what he really means is, hey, Congress, can I have $300 million for Greece and $100 million for Turkey, and I don't want to go fight over there. Right? Kennan writes about the pain, he doesn't really mean it, at least not the way the politicians later took it. Um, we have McCarthy, we have tapes now of LBJ in 64, where Bundy comes to him and says, hey, Vietnam's going really badly, and he says, oh my god, we're not going to get involved, we're not going to send our troops over there, right? So how do you draw a distinction between what is genuine ideology and what is rhetoric that for political reasons becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy? Yeah, that's a good last question. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can talk about the mess. Sure. Uh, that is probably the central question of a lot of my work. Um, so it is a challenge. You can't always know. Uh, I think that one of the things that good scholars do is model humility and recognize that, in fact, we don't necessarily, we cannot always make that case. Uh, for the either one-to-one -one relationship, as some of our social science colleagues would want us to do, right, to su suggest that there's a causal relationship between an idea and a policy outcome, um, or even a, a, a concept that's articulated and the, the way that the rhetoric then um, is operationalized in the world. So, you know, one of the reasons I pointed out the really was excited to point out to, to the audience, just to, to sort of teach and think with you about the John Quincy Adams thing is, how many textbooks have you seen? Uh, I mean, this is a very inside foreign policy thing, that talk about the monsters to destroy line and don't say that that wasn't the original text. And that may or may not matter a lot, but the way I spun out, I think it matters some, right? That was his original thinking, he was, you know, he was right late into the night, this was the, the, what he most wanted. And then, you know, I could unpack and we could talk through the fact that he got lots of letters back and the Russian ambassador thought, that his speech might be a call to take down the British Empire and was very much against monarchies. And so what he thought was this argument for a kind of more circumspect US role in the world, he wanted to adapt more, and then he winds up with the monster show. But you know, I think so early Cold War you point to some great examples, and I think you're right. You know, so then, but then the question becomes: to what extent is this high-level ideology that's being developed, articulated, we see it in policy planning documents? Um, I don't think you need to talk about its authenticity, but where is it represented in other policies? And where does it fall flat? And why? So I think the why is a big part of that. You know, the why does Truman not send troops? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of answers to that why. Domestic politics would be a piece of that story. Uh, the, the ways in which the US Army was demobilizing. The, there's a GI story to that, right? So there's scholars who now, who've now been transcribing GI's letters home. You know, love this stuff. We've got one visiting us at Patriot in a, March, maybe. Uh, GI's letters home, GI's when they come home, they don't want to go back out and police the world after World War II. It's amazing, you can look at their letters. And they say, well, after fighting this war, we, we don't want to go fight another war uh, for Greece or for Turkey or for Italy or anywhere. Uh, and this isn't the view of everybody, but this is a fascinating, so why couldn't you actually enact that policy? There's also bureaucratic impediments, that kind of thing. I don't know if you think that that's the best possible answer, but I would argue ideology has shaping effects that you can see in policy, and you can see a political rhetoric. Uh, and one element of that, I think, about uh, the sort of early Cold War is that national security state works. It works as a domestic politics, and it works as a foreign politics. The national security concept is, is capable of galvanizing large numbers of people. It's what William James called a, a specious abstraction. It's impossible to fight. He argued this about the term patriotism. It's like blowing cold air on a hot fire. You can't beat national security. You're already beaten when it's invoked. Basic, right? That gets to your question. How do you pull back from this set? So uh, uh, that, that's a, sort of a set of permutations from there. But I think that they effectively deploy the language and the politics of an ideology of national security. Or what Andrew Preston calls a paradigm. And the paradigm doesn't have to be necessarily in policy. That, that it's having a larger set of kind of attitudinal effects, like Dr. Robert. 
partial answer. Mm -hmm. It's time for a turn. <laughs> <laughs> of some great conversations going forward and some vital ones. Thanks to everyone who made this moment possible, including Chris Nichols and every, all of the friends of Woody who have helped us to happen. Please let's come and celebrate with Chris.